I mean, I'm not, but I am. <laughs> I probably will ask this to the same employee to give me some extra time for questions. Hey, guys. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tammy. I just flew in from Philly. <laughs> if you've been following the saga, literally just got here. Um, I did the rom-com run through Philly International, but it didn't work. So uh, um, I'm just going to be totally honest with you, warts and all. You're getting an unrehearsed version of this because I was supposed to do it last night and this morning, and I was in airport health. Cool. How exciting. Uh, we are going to talk about, is this, am I making, is it really loud? Okay. We're going to talk about, uh, well, obviously, oh, that's me. I don't want that to be me. Where's my, where'd my, um, where'd my slides go? I don't have, there they are. There's, I mean, look how hard I worked on these, you guys. I need everybody to see them. They're, look at this rainbow. Doing a little rebranding. I don't know who's familiar with Newsletter Ninja, but I'm sick of the yellow and red. I feel like I, like, it, it feels like the McDonald's drive through I'm done, like I'm finished. So I'm doing this whole rainbow situation. Um, so 10 tips for writing emails that people want to read. Because here's the thing. <laughs> You've been told, at least some of you, and many of you didn't believe it, and I love you, you're my people, that people don't read email anymore. That you don't, uh, you should, you know, have Facebook groups and you should, uh, you know, engage people on Instagram and who even opens emails and you're just going to the spam folder and blah, 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 blah. It is not true that people don't read emails anymore. People don't read bad emails. <laughs> people don't read uh, boring emails, right? Uh, irrelevant emails, spammy emails, clickbaity emails, salesy emails. One of the things I teach in the Newsletter Ninja courses is how to talk about your books without sounding like you're selling them all the time. Um, waste of time emails. People don't like emails that make them feel like a number instead of a person, right? So uh, I guess we could have just shorthanded that with emails that suck. Right? So let's talk about how to write emails that do not suck. Maybe that should have been the title of my talk. Um, before I start, is there anyone here who gets my newsletter? Comes out on Tuesdays usually? Okay, I'm going to need you guys later, so hang tight. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give you whew, 10, types of, uh, 10 tips for writing emails that don't suck, emails that people want to read. Um, I think I'm pretty good at, actually, those of you who get my newsletter, I mean, very pretty good emails, yeah. Uh, I get replies. People reply and say I laughed out loud. Those are my favorite replies. Um, people reply just the single word blurt sheets. With if you're if you're on my newsletter, that will mean something to you. Um, people reply and talk about my dog and her snossages, which is a topic that comes up from time to time. And if all of that is like gibberish, and you are like none of that makes any sense to me. Here's the thing: it makes sense to the people who get my newsletter. And that makes us a squad of people who have things in common and in-jokes. And in-jokes is one of the tips, so we'll get to that later. Anyway, we're going to do a bonus tip before I start with my 10, because surprise, I couldn't keep it to 10. <laughs> what a shocker. Before you send a single campaign, you need to communicate to people what your emails are going to be like, what it's going to be like to be on your list. One of the best ways to Cultivate a list full of people who want to read the emails that you send or to let them know, is to let them know what those emails are going to be like so that they can self-select themselves right out of the running if already on sign up, it doesn't sound like it's for them. So that's your bonus tip. Your emails should be anticipated. They should be wanted. You let subscribers know what they're going to get, how often, what you write about, yeah, but you also want to convey the tone and the style of your emails, just right on the sign up page, in the confirmation, during um, onboarding and welcome sequences. Uh, there's actually, there's a little address down at the bottom there, newsletterninja.net slash automation planner. It's got a little hyphen in it. It's a, it's a, you can use it to plan your welcome sequence if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and what it does is sort of link the emails to each other so that you're dragging people kind of through a story. That's very helpful. Uh, you also don't have to. You can probably do this without me because unlike a lot of internet marketers who have to teach people how to send emails, I don't have to teach you guys how to tell a story. You've got that part. And that's the hardest part. If you go out there in the wider world of internet marketing, that's what they're trying to teach all of the 
people coming to them is how to be relatable and tell a story and not just be a salesperson. You guys tell stories all the time. So you've got a leg up already. Um, and the other thing you're gonna wanna do during that confirmation, onboarding, welcome, the whole nine, is offer them a big old unsubscribe button several times so that again, they can show themselves out if they're like, I don't know, this person swears too much or these are too chatty or these emails are too long. I just did an onboarding sequence for a client she wrote the emails because I won't write people's emails for like all the money in China. Um, and when she sent them to me to plug into her onboarding sequence, I was like, these are like 3,000 words long. <laughs> but you know, when I read them, they sounded exactly like her, they sounded exactly like her books. So the people who see those emails and go, I do not have time for this, probably aren't gonna be into her books either. And so let people know, let them self-select, let them know what you're gonna send. You write the best emails in the universe, it's not gonna make any difference if you've got a list full of people who haven't had their expectations set and might not want what you're offering. So the process starts before you even send them their first regular campaign. Here's an example, I don't know how well you can see it, but you'll also get the slide deck after, so, or a little later. Um, it's just an example of a, a welcome email, a confirmation email. It actually doesn't say confirmation in it anywhere because that feels very technological and very, sort of cold to me, so it, instead it's a discussion of click this button to get your book, and then because consent is really important, uh, both for GDPR and romance writers, uh, underneath it says expect an email from me tomorrow, I also send a monthly email, just to let people know what they're getting into when they sign up for this person's list. This is actually the person with the long-winded onboarding, maybe she should tell them that. If you contrast it with this one up in the left here where it just says please confirm subscription, big button. That's not, nobody knows anything about that person. You haven't, you've missed an opportunity there to let people know that you're jokey or irreverent or very serious or you like to use robot emojis or whatever it is that you, know, you do. Down here in this sign up portion where it says sign up to get connected and never miss a thing, you'll also get access to this, your email is safe with me. This person is, you know, this, they haven't gone all out. This isn't, you know, you could inject a lot more personality in here, you could have a picture, you could have something but they've at least started to talk to the person about what they'll get, what, what happens on the list. You can get a little sense of her tone there. Your email is safe with me, exclamation point. It's a person who uses exclamation points. If you're against them, you're gonna bail, okay? So before you even start, set the expectations for them. Item number one, write killer subject lines. Wow, what a revelation. Everybody's like, whoa, I can just leave now. I've gotten everything I need from this talk, right? I had no idea. So, we're actually gonna breeze through this one super fast because what makes a good subject line is such a big topic, I, I can't do it in five. So what we will do is just scrape the surface briefly what makes a good subject line. Hooks, hooks. Something that they see it and it hooks into their brain and makes them wanna open it. There's something inside this email that's gonna be interesting. Maybe it was a really cool question. Maybe it was uh, a hint towards something that's in there. Maybe it was just really funny. Uh, curiosity, I guess that feeds into hooks. Open loops is another thing you could call it. Um, people like roundup numbers, the three best books I read this year, the seven ways I'm gonna whatever, things like that. Humor is always good, although obviously humor is hard to, it's hard to pull off and even harder in writing sometimes, but some of you know that you're good at it, so go not, is Jamie Albright here? She's not here because she doesn't need to learn about email, but that girl is funny. Um, being relatable. In your emails, if you say something about uh, your dog or your spouse or, you know, I probably will send an email when I get back and it'll say something in the subject line about American Airlines. Everybody watch out for that. <laughs> and it's gonna be very relatable. And there will also be swearing. So, just make your subject lines interesting. Again, this is something that internet marketers have to talk to their people about, but I don't particularly have to give you guys chapter and verse about this because you know what's interesting. You know how to hook somebody. You've written a tagline for your book, right? You've written the first sentence of the first chapter, the one that has to make people keep reading the whole rest of the book. So you know how to do this. Readers, one thing that I wanted to say and didn't, because I'm a moron, um, and because I haven't gone through the speech yet, is um, you want to personalize those subject lines where and when you can. Not every time, certainly. Um, that gets tedious as well. And I personally will just tell you right now, because if you're starting, you're out there and you're starting to get a little skeptical, 
I hate personalized subject lines. <laughs> I get mad and I think, who do you think you're fooling? I get really like upset about it because I have mental problems. Um, but surprise, I'm not my reader. You're not your reader. Um, I don't do it a ton on the newsletter ninja list because you all are really savvy and know if I put the name in there, it's for like deliverability purposes or to increase open, like you guys have my number. Um, so I don't bother with it very often, but your list is not my list. I do things very differently on the fiction side. And readers are, as it turns out, according to Campaign Monitor, 26% more likely to open a personalized subject line. Um, there's a company called Validity. Um, I wasn't able to track now exactly like where they started or whatever, but they do these sort of big marketing surveys. And um, one of the things that they found was that subscribers actually will will tell you if you ask as a as a surveyor, you know, like do you like it when you have your name in the subject line? And they go, oh yes, I definitely I open that. I open that more often. So if you don't know how to do that, um, there's too many email providers for me to tell you, but uh, there'll be customer service docs or you can reach out to your customer service at Mailer Relate, Convert Kit, whatever, ask them how you do it. It'll be a placeholder, you know, percent sign, first name, percent sign or something like that. And you can put that in the subject, you can put it right in the body of the email at the beginning, however it is that you want to do it, but the subject line, that will make them open it. Um, it'll make them more likely to open it anyway. Sprinkle that in there from time to time and you'll find that it will make a big difference. Um, Personalized promotional mailings have, according to this, a 29% higher unique open rate and a 41% higher unique click rate than non-personalized ones. Again, I don't want to get into a four-hour topic, so we're not going to talk about iOS 15. <laughs> but with the advent of iOS 15, clicks are a lot more important to us now than they were. Um, you can definitely say that open rates were always kind of a vanity metric, and maybe we should have been looking at click rates the whole time, but you know, we should have been doing a lot of things, and sometimes we didn't, and that's fine. But now, with open rates having become unreliable for Apple users, unreliable, un unusable for Apple users, um, we're gonna need to be looking at click rates more. So if personalizing in the body of the email is gonna make them more likely to click that link that's two lines down, you should probably be doing that, if only so that you can get some more accurate ideas about who's actually opening your emails. So there's that. Okay, so we're gonna say, I'm gonna switch out my glasses because I'm an old lady. Um, and I actually can see that awesome, but not the thing that's right in front of me. Like, that's a cruel joke, right? Okay. Use microcopy in your preview or preheader text, whatever you call it. Who here doesn't know what preview or preheader text even is? Sweet, that's fine. When you get an email in your inbox, sometimes it'll say, you know, catchy subject line, and then there's a little something right after that before it's like, sometimes it's just the first line of an email, some providers do that. But sometimes it's a little little piece of just a little funny something or it compliment, whoop, compliments the subject line in some way or whatever, just this little, little bitty thing, that's your pre-header. In MailerLite, it's super easy to find when you open the interface to write your email, it's in the top left corner, you click the edit section, I think I actually have a graphic coming up for that, um, and you just change over on the right. It's easy in active campaign because it's the last thing that you do. You can do it in ConvertKit, but you do have to put a little bit of HTML code in the email. ConvertKit customer service will send you that if you just ask them, how do I change my preheader text? If you don't, it's not a disaster. They're just gonna see the first couple of words of your email, and maybe your emails are so awesome that that functions just fine. But it's an excellent opportunity to use what you call microcopy, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like, a little bit of copywriting that's just teeny and cute. Um, sometimes you'll see microcopy like in a clever sidebar um, comment or uh, like a, a photo caption. Um, one that I use in the nonfiction newsletter is this picture of my dog with a bag of snossages, which are bad treats. I know you're not supposed to feed your dog that. Um, and the caption always says, do you want Mocha to starve? And it's hilarious to me anyway. Um, and apparently to some people who reply to me and say so. So uh, one place that you guys use microcopy is in your taglines. Taglines have to be short, right? You're trying to get them over the fold in Amazon and you wanna make sure that they're pithy and they really hook people and whatever. So when you're brainstorming your tagline and you take it down from like 100 words, right? And you're like throwing words out and you're condensing, whoops, and you're condensing things and you're like, oh, I put those three words together and make a stronger word and now it's only seven words long. That's microcopy. Um, and you don't have to work as hard in your newsletter as you do at your, at your tagline to make it tiny and perfect. So that's good. Um, 
so yeah, microcopy is just anywhere that you don't have a lot of room or you're just trying to just knock off some quick thing, condensing words down as much as possible. So in your um, preview and pre-header pre text, if you can use something there that's going to capture reader attention, make them laugh, uh, just anything that's gonna surprise and delight, really, is kind of what you're going for with any copy, right? Um, I think, yeah, I got some examples coming up here. Okay, so yeah, here's the mailer light version up there in the upper left where it says you're in danger um, of being unsubscribed, just so you know, she wasn't like threatening them. Um, although, <laughs> that would be really funny. Um, so if you, if you click on that little, you know, that little pencil button in the upper right, you get this interface over here where you would, where you would change the, um, the pre header text, and you can do that. Here's what happens if you uh, look at it, this is on my phone. So this is an email I sent a few, couple few weeks ago. I don't know, whatever the date says. Um, I sent it to myself, because I'm on my own list, obviously. Hey, Tammy, do you like to watch? Um, and then the, the microcopy is, get your mind out of the gutter. Because I knew what y'all were thinking, because that's why I wrote that subject line. I mean, I'm not, I mean, that was on purpose, right? Um, so that gives them a little whatever. What's important to know is don't put anything really important in there, because not every email client shows it. And also not every email marketing system is going to let you change it. And if you can't, let it go. <laughs> that's, life, that's how life works, it's totally fine. Um, I'm very echoey, sorry about that. Okay, I literally ran down here from Christine's room, you guys. <laughs> I washed my face and put on my sparkly shirt and just ran. Um, next tip, write to one person. Um, Again, if you're on my list, you guys can testify. I don't just write to one person. I definitely refer to everybody kind of as a big amalgam of writer blob. I say, hey, y'all, and you guys know, and whatever. Because you, because you know. <laughs> it's just, it would feel so artificial and so weird to be like, so Voss, let me tell you about blah, blah, blah. And Voss would be like, I, wasn't, I was born in the day, Tammy, but it wasn't yesterday. Totally get that. But when you're writing to your fiction people, they actually respond incredibly well both to the personalization like we talked to, and this is kind of an extension of that, to being spoken to as though you're writing directly to them. Now deep down in their heart, they mostly know that you're not. They don't all know that you're not, which is a little weird. Um, it's really weird. Um, there was a romance author a while back who's, he was a male romance author, and his onboarding sequence was a story with the person reading as the main character was written in second person. So you go to the bar, there's a hot tattooed bad boy there. I don't know, I don't remember it all, but I bet there was a hot tattooed bad boy. Um, and uh, you like the way his I don't know, hair looks, whatever, I don't know what happened. He was probably better at writing than I just was. But at any rate, um, when he stopped publishing and his uh, constituents were absolutely devastated. I was shocked by the number of people who said, I still have that story he wrote for me when I joined his list. And I was like, sweetheart, he did not, that didn't happen, that's not. But there was a startling non-zero number of people who were very affected by that and felt that it was really written to them personally. So be personable, or be personal, also be personable. Um, the other thing, though, apart from making them feel great, like, oh, man, this is so cool, this author wrote to me, it also will make things easier for you, just give it a try if you're not already doing this, to have a kind of a subscriber avatar in your head, somebody that you can be directing to. It's not all that different from having, like, an ideal reader in your head that you're writing your book to. Maybe you have one of those. A lot of people do. Um, it's a lot like that. So this is somebody that you can envision. You can picture them sitting down with you at the kitchen table for a glass of wine or at a coffee shop. Maybe you guys are gonna you know, go to a movie. You can do what you want with your subscriber avatar. It's not my business. So do whatever. But if you've got one person, look at this cute graphic that I made. So if you've got somebody, right, you just pick someone. Pick them and look. There is actually, and they don't cost any money, um, a series of subscriber, well, they're all pretty much the same worksheet, but they just have a different picture. Um, at that address, newsletterninja.net slash avatars. I mean, it asks for an email sign up. What, like, you guys are, I mean, I'm a ninja. But, but, <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. Um, and there's a page on my website that just has, like, I don't know, four dozen of these pictures. They don't have faces, because I felt like that was actually a little too personal. But there are people of, you know, different races. There's kids, there's older people, there's men, there's women. There's a, there's a worksheet that does not actually, um, 
have a picture and it has they pronouns. So if you want to just move a picture over to one of those, it's, it's very inclusive. It's an inclusive situation. So um, you could go there if you want and say, oh, that lady in the suit, she looks interesting. Or that one in the upper left is wearing like some kind of like Victorian like blouse situation. That's kind of cool. Um, but you can find these, you can find people on the internet. You can say, I think that my subscriber avatar is, you know, I don't know, she's about 30. She probably got two kids. Maybe she's a secretary. Go Google that. Who comes up? Does that person look like someone you could write your email to? I know this sounds like super woo woo. Like, I know that's not a real person. Well, it's probably a real person if there's a picture, but they're probably not on your newsletter. Uh, but try it. Seriously, give it a shot. Um, and writers are better at telling themselves stories than anybody, so probably it'd work out pretty well. So, um, and as I said, there's a worksheet there too that asks a lot of questions about them. So again, if you go out into the world and you talk to like internet marketers, they're gonna tell you to make a customer avatar or an ideal, ideal something, something, I can't remember that, I don't listen to them because they're terrible, but um, those questions are all like, they all seem to revolve around like money and status and pain points and your people don't have pain points. Like their pain point is I need a good book to read and that's not much of a pain point. Um, although certainly if you can leverage that and get them to read your very good book, that's awesome. But so the questions on these worksheets are like, what kind of books do they read? What TV do they like? Who do they talk to about the books they write? Stuff that might actually get you thinking about the kind of people that are on your newsletter because you don't need to sell them whatever those people are selling, you just need to sell them a $4 ebook. Like, it's, it's a different set of questions. So give that a shot, it's kind of cool. Um, as I said, I don't do that on my list. That's a, that's a hill I'll die on. You guys are not gonna get the warm fuzzies if I, if, I, if I do that. But do as I say, not as I do. My mother used to say that to me when I was little. Like she smoked cigarettes, for example, and she'd say, do as I say, not as I do. Okay, mom. Uh, oh, here we go. Be known for something. So this is where you're gonna have mascots. Obviously on the ninja list, what's my mascot? My little guy up there, my little ninja guy. I love him, right? My cover designer found him. His bag didn't say email. He's just stock imagery from like deposit photos or whatever. But as it happens, the person who made him, he's on a page like three by four, so there's like a dozen of him, right? And there are like eight of those. So I have scores of my ninja guy. I have him hanging around in a pile of money. That one's exciting. I have him uh, looking at a map. I have him with a compass. I have him making an omelet. Probably not going to be able to use that one. Reading a newspaper. So um, I actually use him in a little graphic and the sections of my newsletter sometimes are set off with a little header graphic that says like ninja announcements and he's got a little megaphone and it'll tell people that a course is opening or I made you a blurk sheet or whatever. Um, or ninja news and we'll talk about uh, iOS 15. Although I think I'm done talking about that. Um, it's still something I'm figuring out over there, uh, but the ninja guy's a good start. Uh, working on in-jokes, uh, the blurk sheet thing is one, because one time I wrote the word worksheet like four times in a paragraph, and I was deliriously tired while writing this email, so then I just wrote blurk sheet, blurk sheet, blurk sheet, like three times, and I got like 300 replies. People thought that was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. Um, so I'm glad that my, my, my extremists brought hilarity. Um, so we're still working on that just a little bit, but people love it. Here we are in my Facebook group with people just, just pulling out the end joke, just talking about the blurb sheets. Hilariously, there's like a thousand people in this group and probably 900 of them don't even know what, what that means. <laughs> so they're like, these people are all clearly crazy. But the people who do know what it means, what it does is it, it binds you together, kind of, right? So you're a little squad of people who all have an end joke and that's really cool. Um, another thing that is not written here anywhere, but that is really good for that is giving your people that y get your newsletter, give them a name. So mine's easy. I say, hey, ninjas. I mean, <laughs> why, why would I waste any time trying to think of something better? Um, but if you write in a certain genre, you might, you know, something might be obvious to you to address them as. Um, start calling them something. Give them a name. Give them a, give them a squad of people to belong to. Give them a sense of, of belonging and identity as part of your fandom. And that's pretty cool, right? Um, Doctor Who has its Whovians. You know, wouldn't it be cool if your people identified themselves so strongly that they would say the equivalent of like, oh, I'm a Whovian. I never say that because it's a stupid word. I say, oh, I'm a fan of Doctor Who. That's even stupider. But I am. Um, there's Mocha. Gratuitous picture of my dog. Um, so this is a triptych because I'm an artiste. Um, and here she is wishing I would give her some snossages and then trying to get the snossage and then getting a snossage. 
I use this because I'm deeply uncomfortable asking people for money. So any time that I actually create something that costs money, which is like, my most recent thing was like $9. And I was like, oh God, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And Christine was like, seriously. Um, but so I included this picture of Mocha and at the bottom it says, do you want Mocha to starve? Like she needs sausages, guys. Uh, and it makes me feel better. Um, my steamy romance pen name, she's super into Jason Momoa, probably more even than I am. I mean, he's fine. I, that's fine. But she's like, that's her thing. It's kind of a thing that has become an in thing in her group. And one of my readers sent me, actually, I gave it, I gave it to Mocha. One of my readers sent me, I'm not joking you, a blanket. It's about yay big. It's really for a toddler, so that's, it's weird that it has Cal Drogo on it. <laughs> so we've got this. It's her Cal Drogo blankie. I, I sent it to the, um, she went to the kennel for the week to be boarded, and they were like, okay. I'm like, it's a, <laughs> I write romance. It's a long story. I got I to gotta ace the airport. <laughs> Bye. Um, but how cool is that, right? Like, they identify that so strongly with her that somebody took out their wallet and bought this really cool thing and put it in the mail to me. And it's way too small for me, and I gave it to my dog. Don't tell them. Um, although I love my dog, so they probably would think it was a compliment. Um, and that's like, that's so cool, right? If you are, uh, if you spend even 10 seconds in Lucy Score's reader group on Facebook, Lucy loves tacos, believe me, <laughs> loves them. And her readers are all about it, sending her taco memes, posting this and that. Um, she especially loves Taco Bell, God love her. She's not gonna get like highfalutin about it. Um, and her people just associate that with her. So imagine that you're out there and you drive by a Taco Bell and you just think about this author that you like. That's so powerful. Um, I don't think people come across snossages a lot in their life, so actually I gotta rethink this and come up with something a little more. But if they do and they think of me, that's awesome. Um, David Gogren always includes a link to whatever music he's listening to as he composes his uh, email. If any of you are on his nonfiction newsletter, um, he'll send a newsletter with a bunch of tips and at the bottom it'll say today's music is and there'll just be a link to like YouTube or something, whatever music he's into that day or that week. Um, the person I was talking about earlier with the super crazy long onboarding emails, she always includes a video link at the very end because of the topic that she writes about. She's introducing people kind of to a different, a slightly different culture and she often sends um, a link to that. So, five, what am I doing? Oh, I gotta speed up. Write in your own voice. It's really important. Don't try to sound like someone you're not. Uh, pretend to be something you're not. People can usually spot a phony anyway, except these people on that one list who thought that guy wrote that story to them, which is still so mind boggling to me. Um, the other thing though is that it might make you less likely to write your emails because you, you have to think about it. You gotta try harder, you gotta slip into that persona. You have to like do this whole like preparation thing to get ready to write to your, just, just sit down and write as yourself. It's the only thing you've got that nobody else has. These people are not hurting for books, guys. I don't mean to be a downer <laughs> at the author conference, but these people are not hurting for books. You can't swing a cat on Amazon without hitting a book, obviously. It's kind of started out as the whole point. So they are not hurting for books. What they can't get from anybody else is your books and your voice and your specific sort of present and authentic self. So again, sounds kind of woo, but be yourself. That's actually the thing that you're best at, so go nuts. Um, optimize for people's eyeballs. So don't subject them to a wall of text. Give them a lot of white space. Uh, leave a lot of blank space between paragraphs and make those paragraphs much shorter than you think they should be. Uh, whatever you learned in high school English about three sentences to a paragraph, no, this, not, this is a newsletter, not your dissertation. Just lead them through really fast. Um, in email, people are often reading on their phones. It's something like 45% of people. I should have looked it up and put the prescription in here. Prescription? Percentage. I need a prescription. People should have put, I should have put the percentage in here. People read, something like 45% of people open their emails on their phones. And a humongous number of people read their emails on their phones in their bed. Like they're, it's late, they're tired, their eyes are just, cut them some slack. Give them a lot of white space in between paragraphs. Uh, if you have an excerpt from your work in progress, double space between those paragraphs, even though obviously you'd never do that in a book. Um, if writing that way doesn't come naturally, then just write it how you would write it, but then go back and find the places where you can break. Any place where the, the theme or the tone or anything just shifts even the tiniest bit, boom, boom, new paragraph. Um, no one is gonna email you and be like, there's too many paragraphs, <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. Um, and think about the poor guy on his phone who does not want that entire screen 
full of text lines. Give him, give him some breathing room. Uh, if it feels like too much, it's fine. The rules are different. Um, if you are, and I should have said this in the last tip actually, if you read your emails out loud, that helps a ton with the last tip about sounding like yourself, so rewind in your head. Um, because if you read the emails out loud and you find yourself stumbling, you know you're not in your voice. You're probably trying to do something that doesn't come naturally to you, so that's really helpful. You could even dictate your emails and then just transcribe them. Then you'd really sound like yourself. But over here, we're coming back to, the, back to now, to the optimize for eyeballs. When you're reading these out loud, if you pause, there you go, there's your double break. Because you just naturally, that's a place where you stopped. So do that. But in addition to making it easy on the eyes with all the white space, also make it interesting to people's eyes. Optimizing is not just about ease of reading, but it's awful about awesome about that. Also about the pleasure of reading, the joy of reading, right? Which sounds very, but whatever. You guys are readers. I know that. Um, colors, uh, images. Use buttons instead of text links where you can. People love a big old button. Um, a well-branded header at the top of your email that uses, you know, the fonts from your books, the colors from your website, whatever. Um, you can make your sign off like an actual signature, just an image of a signature, or just use a fancy handwritten font or something. Um, emojis, people love emojis. People are crazy about emojis. They increase open rates if you use them in subject lines, like by a ton. Those of you who've read Newsletter Ninja will know the emoji in your subject line that increases open rates more than any other emoji is the poop emoji. <laughs> that is a true story. I don't have occasion to use it, but if I did, just think of my open rates. Um, vary the font styling. Um, it's hard to read paragraph after paragraph of the exact same thing. Give them headers. Consider a table of contents. I um, get a newsletter from a cover designer who does that, and I do it at Newsletter Ninja. It'll just say, in this email, and it's got like four points I'm going to hit. A couple emails ago, it said, just straight sales, because <laughs> like, I just had a new thing that I wanted people to buy. So that was awkward. Threw that snossage picture in there. You guys made me feel better. Um, headers are good, tables of contents, uh, literally changing a font, but you're going to want to be easy on that only because a lot of font changes, color changes, lots, you know, those are things that will send you to spam or promotions because the Gmail robots will look at it and go, this guy's a little too excited, probably spam. So just go easy on it. Um, I don't think this tip is in here anywhere, but what you want is, I'll put it on the page that I'm going to give you a link to after just to be sure, but there's a, I think it's called Mail Tool Tester and there's a, it's a website that you can email your emails to before you send them to your list that will give you an idea of deliverability um, and anything that might be working against you. And one of the things you might see is maybe cool it with the fonts, man, and then you would. Um, and then all of that said about making your emails really visually interesting, now and again, just send them a plain text email. I mean, it doesn't strictly have to be plain text, although that's not a bad idea either, but um, something that's stripped down, something that doesn't have a ton of pictures and a bunch of you know, buzzing and whirring and exciting things and 15 cool buttons. Like, just every once in a while, just send them two paragraphs of like, this is what I'm up to, this is what I'm writing, gotta run, bye. Looks like, you know, she's just jotting off a note because she's busy this week for the newsletter or this month or however often you send it. It gives them a little break. It gives those people who aren't necessarily all that into your super, like, made emails, like, oh, sometimes she just sends a quickie, and I love those. It also, <clears throat> technologically speaking, is going to help you with, like, Gmail, Hotmail, all those people who don't want to put your emails through because it looks like an email you would just have written, like, to a friend. And um, those, that will weigh heavily in them deciding where you land in the inbox. I got 12 minutes and four more tips. Let's do it. Actually, yeah, I have five because there's another bonus. <laughs> Punch up your CTAs, guys. Um, I don't know that that makes people want to read your emails better, but it gets you better results, so we're including it. Punch up your CTAs. They need to actually give people reasons to do what you're asking because if they open your emails and they always say, go here and buy my book, and that's what the link is, eventually they're going to stop opening because that's very boring. Nobody wants to hear, go buy my book, go read about my thing, go look at this thing that I did, me, 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 me put something in there for them, right? So uh, maybe my steamy pen name puts in a, I don't know, a link to a picture of Henry Cavill instead of freaking Jason Momoa for a change, right? Like something for them, something that they will like, um, something that will be interesting to them and that when they click it and go look at it, the benefit to you is not immediately obvious because that makes people think just a little bit differently about you. Like, oh, she's just, I don't see where she's making any money off this picture of Henry Cavill, so I'll just enjoy it. 
perfect. Uh, that is not appropriate for all of you. Some probably like sci-fi people are going to want to send that. Uh, the fantasy people though can send like witch Witcher pics. So there you go. Um, when you do have a CTA that you're asking them to do something for you, go buy your book is obviously a big one, but also like look at this thing that I did or vote for me in this thing or whatever. Try to make those things sound like opportunities instead of favors. So you don't say follow me on Pinterest because the more followers I have, the more likely that they'll show my stuff to people. You say follow me on Pinterest to see the celebrity casting for my various characters. Here is a great chance for that picture of Henry Cavill I keep making up in my head. Uh, follow me on Insta for dog pics. Follow my, uh, join my Facebook group because um, I go live when I release a book. Right? These are things that benefit them when they show up, one assumes, as opposed to just benefiting you. Um, you don't have to, they, you don't just tell them what to do, tell them, tell them why, and make that why be something that is for them, not for you. Then they're like, oh my god, I love to get her emails. She always puts really cool stuff in there for me, which is, I mean, that's kind of a win. Utilize your PS intelligently. It is an overused truism that the PS is an important real estate in your marketing emails. In this case, the, uh, the root word of that is true because it is. They are, in fact, really important. Some folks just skip to the PS, and those are, like, I think the people that read the last pages of books before they buy them, and I do not understand those people, like, at all. But they genuinely do. They're serial killers, I think, is what I'm saying. But they just skip right to the PS. Like, whatever, I know the most important stuff is down there. We could have a whole chicken and egg discussion about whether they look in the PS that marketers have trained them to or whether they just do that and marketers have learned. Doesn't matter. What does matter is what's in the PS, they're going to notice. Even people who just skim the email real quick, definitely pay attention to what's down there. It's going to have your highest click-through rate. If you have, say, my book is for sale up here in the body, and my book is, don't forget, guys, grab this. It's, the PS is going to have a higher, if you have like heat maps or a lot of the email service providers will show you who's, um, wh where people are clicking the most. You will see that the, the PS ones, even if the exact same link is elsewhere on the page, the PS will get the most clicks. I just did this a couple days ago, uh, maybe not a couple days ago, it was National Sandwich Day. But a thing that I do in the Newsletter Ninja newsletter is to tell you if it's like it's a, a weird like observance day, like National Get Funky Day. Actually missed that, but whatever. Um, so it was National Sandwich Day, and the link I included had a list of places you could go get to get like discounts or free sandwiches because National Sandwich Day. Um, there was a link right at the top because that's the first thing I do is say, hey, ninjas, happy sandwich day or whatever. And then there was a link in the bottom that said, seriously, free sandwiches, guys. Click here. Um, and the bottom one was, I think, four times as many clicks as the one up in the body, but they were the, they were the same thing. So pay attention to your PSs. This is where the most important thing gets reiterated. I'm going to say don't save it. <laughs> That's silly. But um, reiterate whatever the most important thing is here. Take away a sale, a give, an ask. Resend to people who don't open sometimes. And you're not going to want to resend every single email. I do resend every email unless I forget. Um, but again, that's nonfiction. My list is not your list. Um, I have things I really want people to see. I say that like you don't want people to see your email. It's just nonfiction is different. You're going to have to take my word on that one. Um, and if your email was something that's just kind of a regular monthly newsletter, kind of here's what I'm up to. I'm still working on book A, and this is happening, and here's a picture of my cat. Probably you don't have to resend that. It's fine if someone misses this little catch up on whatever's going on. But if it's something important, or if it's launch week, you're going to do resending. That is really important. Um, for launch week, I actually don't ever send a straight resend. What I do in launch week is I, I do duplicate the email because why reinvent the wheel? But then I go through and I kind of tweak it so it doesn't read exactly the same. And I put in some kind of reason that I'm updating them on what's going on with launch week. So I resend the email and then I go in and I add like, oh my god, you guys, you got to check out this really cool review. This is for fiction that I'm talking about. Um, you got to check out this cool review I got and put one of the early reviews that came in. It gives people a little, just a little ping to remind them, that's right, it's release week and I didn't pick it up because I read it on my phone. I mean, I'm not the only one, right? Because I open the email on my phone and go, oh, mark that as unread so I can get to it later. And I currently have 18,000 emails in my Gmail box <clears throat> that I'm going to read later. So yeah, resend during launch week or anything that's super important. So if I'm changing genres or you know whatever, resend those. Um, and occasionally you might just want to resend one because you notice that open rates are getting a little bit low and you want to catch a few stragglers who maybe don't happen to be at their desk when you send whatever because we all get a lot of email and they're easy to miss. 
So resend occasionally um, and try to keep the open rates up. As they come down, here's the next piece. Don't go to that link on the bottom because I'm pretty sure it's a 404. <laughs> because I was supposed to do some more work on this presentation yesterday and today instead of standing at the American ticket counter crying like a little bitch. So <laughs> remove, but there will be something later and I'll get to that in a second. Remove unengaged subscribers from your list. That is a very controversial thing to say. It's a hill I will die on. Having people who don't open your list, or don't open your emails, depresses your open rate. This is just a fact. It's math. Um, so there's not really a lot of point in having any debate about it. Just do what I say. Every once in a while, go through, find the people who aren't opening, send them a quick re-engage segment. That's what that hygiene link is going to take you to someday. Send them a few quick um, emails. My phone's going off. How embarrassing. Send them a few quick emails to say, are you still reading? I, I'm not going to send you emails if you're not reading them because, and this is important, I don't want to send emails to people who don't want to get them. We always talk about them, not, I don't want you clogging up my Miller Lite, Miller Lite list, you cost a lot of money, even though sometimes that's a reason. Um, and then if they don't open, click, reply, dump them. Your, your bill's going to go down, that's exciting. Your open rates are going to go up. Again, that's just math, the people who don't open left. They're not going to be 100, though, which is going to piss you off because you just threw off all the people who don't open. But there you have it. But they will definitely go out up. The last re-engage and purge I did for somebody, her open rates went from about 27 to 49. That's pretty great. Um, where are the other 51%? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but they'll open eventually. So remove them. I have one more bonus tip, and I got three minutes. Split test everything. Just absolutely everything. Split test. Um, the reason for that is because everything I just said to you might not be true for your list. You might try uh, sending pictures of your dog and your whole list hates dogs and it's a terrible idea and they all unsubscribe. You're better off without them because dogs are amazing, but you just don't know. You just do not know until you test it. So some services make this easy. <sighs> as much as I hate to say it, MailChimp always made it really easy. Um, I think ConvertKit makes split testing super, super easy if anyone here is on ConvertKit. Um, it's a little harder with MailerLite because you'll have to actually set up two separate emails and then sort of divide the list. But split test things. When you're split testing, you only change one thing. This is a scientific method. We all know this, right? One thing. So if you break the email into two groups and send it to them, you only change the subject line or you only change the wording of the call to action or you only change that one of them has a text link and one of them has a big old button. Only one thing is different in the email and then you look at those and see which one of those got the most of the response that I wanted it to get and you do more of that to your list. Seriously though, split, test, everything. Um, and that's it, that's the last tip. I'm gonna give you, again, maybe don't go to that 20 books 2021 link for maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> Seriously, guys, it's so janky up here right now. I'm like, ah, ah. Uh, but everything else works great. Um, Newsletter Ninja, obviously, the top one. You can find me there. And from there, you can find your way to most things that happen in the, um, on the website. Um, that second link will be a place where you will be able to get this slide deck, among other things. What I'm actually going to do is throw up just a quick sign up. It is not a mailing list sign up. It will just add you to a very temporary list on my website server, it's not active campaign, um, so that I can email you when the page gets updated. And then it'll have the slide deck and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Um, I also have a Facebook group, groups slash newsletter ninja, easy to find. Um, and you can email me personally, Tammy at newsletterninja.net. I have an admin that's protective enough that I'm comfortable doing that, um, but she will let through things that she knows I'll find interesting or want to reply to or she'll reply and give you a stock answer if it's a question people ask all the time or whatever, but you can definitely just email there directly. Um, but the Facebook group is actually a great place to go, and I hate to say that because I hate Facebook with like everything I have in me, but there's a lot of people in there, a lot of really smart people. Um, I don't, Erica, are you here? Erica Everest is in there, and she's my go-to for Mail or Light whenever anybody asks a question. I'm just like, I don't know, ask Erica. Um, there's just a ton of really smart people. Christine is the king at getting mail or light to do the stuff that Active Campaign does, which is kind of cool. Um, queen of the workaround. Um, David Gogren's in there, and he always has lots of opinions, as I'm sure you know. So um, 
it's a really, it's a fun group. And if you have a question, probably someone else in there has it too. So we can crowd share, crowd source, crowd something, our questions and answers and benefit more people. I have 24 seconds left. Um, if you have questions, come up to the microphone. Do we still have time for questions, Michael? Is there still time? I can see Michael, that's why I asked. I don't, I don't know, ask the tech guys. Nobody has any questions? All right, come up to the mic. Any tips on reactivating a dormant list? Yes, I do have tips on activating a dormant list. Number one tip. Oh, that, I thought that was that. I do have tips on reactivating a dormant list. Tip number one, the most important one, don't be weird. Like, just don't be weird about it. You can, like, show up to your list and be like, oh, my God, you guys, I'm so sorry. I haven't emailed in, like, 12 months, and it's because all this stuff happened, and here's a big explanation, and here's, and I'm really sorry, and I'm going to, like, tell you how sorry I am 20 times, and I'm giving you a bunch of free stuff, and blah, blah, blah. Don't be weird. It's fine. But life happens. They understand that life happens. Uh, you slide on in and go, wow, long time no see, huh? And just proceed. Here's what I've been up to, if that's appropriate. Hey, while I was away, I wrote three books. You can check them out over here. Um, while I was away, I had a baby. Here's a picture, or not, if you're not a baby sharing sort of person, which I totally get. Um, tell them what you've been up to, if that's appropriate. Don't get super heavy with them if you were away for 12 months, because like four of your family members and your dog all died. Like that's terrible, but nobody wants that to be the first thing you email them after a year. So just don't be weird. Don't be like uncomfortably personal. You just show up and say, I'm really sorry. I haven't been around because things have been crazy, but I'm here now and here's what I'm gonna be doing going forward. And then, this is the probably actually as important as the don't be weird tip, do what you said. Because you can't do that more than once every few years. <laughs> You're, you can't show up and then like send three regular campaigns and then ghost them for eight months and show back up again and go like, hey guys, everything was crazy again because um, they get really tired of that. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, but I've been very good this time around since August, so my newsletter people are happy, I think. So yeah, don't be weird. Catch them up in an appropriate way and just then be consistent going forward. Yeah. Once a month is plenty, um, but it always is and it depends. This is one of those like, you know, how long does a piece of rope have to be kind of questions because it depends on so many different things. I tell people to keep it to a month or more frequently than a month just for technological reasons, reputation and deliverability reasons, because if you go longer than 30 days, you start to take a little bit of a ding on reputation and deliverability. Uh, but again, if you're gonna send an email that just doesn't have anything interesting in it and people are gonna be like, her emails stink, you're gonna take more of a hit on deliverability. So even then, if, if it's six weeks or eight weeks, it just is, but be consistent, be really regular, only send them emails that have something interesting and or valuable in there for them. And if you don't yet, then I guess maybe don't write quite that frequently. But I know fiction writers who send an email every week or every two weeks. They just have a lot to talk about, I guess. Anyone else? Done? Yay! All right, go to your next thing. Go, go, go.